Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Peter Riddle. I'm director of the Institute for Government. Welcome um, uh, to the Institute. This is our second public event of, of the um, late summer, um, and it's going to be a treat. I, I received a phone call in um, June. Um, can I um, speak to um, um, Oliver Letter? And it's always a pleasure to talk to Oliver. Normally, I, I think, you know, what logical fallacies have I, I committed? Because <laughs> Oliver will always point them out to me and uh, correct me. But no, it, it was. I wanted to do a speech about the civil service. I said, Splendid! You, this is exactly the place to come. And then we discussed when it would be. And I went round and um, saw him on his uh, interesting perch overlooking the practice courts for beach volleyball, um, <laughs> which I'm sure, to his pleasure, and that of his private office, have now reverted to the normal peace and quiet of the of the horse guard. And he, he wanted to do a speech. And we had an interesting discussion about the the title um, um, on the role of the civil service. And um, Oliver, I, as I know, has, has observed the civil service in many aspects, now as a minister, um, but um, also as a senior policy advisor um, within um, Number 10 uh, during the Thatcher era and later. So he's observed very much what's gone on. So he's got a particular perspective, but also his own originality and intellectual rigour. I know from having discussed with him the content of the speech will be absolutely fascinating. Um, so. It's why mandarins matter, although I can just give away one line of what, it, what, what you're about to say. It says at the top, much more mundanely, civil service speech. But I know it's going to be much more than that. Oliver Lettering. Um, well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I should say that, that uh, I'm not sure whether it was the beach volleyball or your visit, but... Um, I've now found myself moved to number nine Downing Street uh, ah. with a different view. Um, and uh, um, this is an extremely good indication of how the uh, um, whole machine works. It's, of course, very important where you are located physically at all times. Um, I, I want to start by, by telling you a few stories. Uh, they come from a previous life uh, in which, instead of participating in the government of my own country, I was wandering around the world advising other governments on the restructuring and privatization of their nationalized industries. I can see some very distinguished uh, exponents of the same thing sitting right in this room. Uh, in country A, I looked uh, for senior civil servants when I was attending meetings with the minister in charge of the economy. Uh, there weren't any. Uh, no one at all, apart from secretaries in the sense of typists and receptionists, and I didn't find it easy to get anything done there. In country B, I spent many happy weeks in detailed discussion with a highly intelligent, courteous, and urbane group of officials. I had the sense that we were making immense progress. It was only at this point that I discovered that none of these highly intelligent, courteous, and urbane people had the slightest connection with the making of decisions. This was done <laughs> elsewhere. In country C, by contrast, I found I was discussing matters with exactly the right group of people. One of the issues uh, that arose was that a certain law needed to be changed. I somewhat tremulously inquired how long it would take to change this law. Uh, 24 hours was the response. <laughs> it appeared that the processes to which we're used in our democracy were somewhat curtailed in that somewhat less than democratic environment. Uh, in country D, I became progressively more unable to understand why what was happening was happening until I managed to grab the proverbial drink with a senior official who spoke English. He explained to me patiently the personal financial agenda, the very personal, very financial agenda, of each of the principal officials with whom I had been dealing, uh, all then became and remained very much clearer. And I can't end these stories from abroad without telling you about country E, in which the uh, government for which I was working found itself displaced uh, with the aid of a few tanks and other armaments, by the previous occupants, a rather more exciting way of changing administration than we're used to in this country. Why, why am I regaling you with these uh, snippets from my long past global wanderings? I'm doing so in order to illustrate the fact that our system of government, despite all its current difficulties, is not by any means to be taken for granted. I want today to set out the way in which I think the administrative civil service ought to function in our liberal democracy. And I want to give you what I regard as two pieces of good news. The first is that I believe the administrative civil service today, at its best, does function in the way I'm going to describe. And the second piece of good news is I believe the reforms being carried through by my colleague Francis Maud 
and uh, Sir Bob Kerslake will hugely improve the chances of the civil service operating in the right way where it isn't currently doing so. But before I proceed with my main argument, I want to clear a little ground by describing more precisely what I mean when I refer to Whitehall or civil service administrators. First, to give an idea of scale, I'm talking about fewer than 20,000 people at any given time. That's under 5% of today's civil service. What are these people meant to be? Let me begin to answer that question by explaining what I think they are not meant to be. Although it's certainly useful for them to have had operational experience, when they're acting as administrators, they aren't meant to be operators or managers, except to a slight extent of one another, of course. They are not meant to be delivering services. Second, they aren't meant to project the power of the state. They aren't the armed forces or any other form of force. Third, though they need to work closely with economists and accountants and scientists and statisticians and other professionals of those kinds, they aren't themselves meant to be experts in any particular technical discipline. Fourth, although their work is bound up with the making and enforcement of law, they are not meant to be lawyers or judges or police officers. Fifth, though nearly all they do depends on finance and has immense effects on business, they are not meant to be financiers or businessmen. So much for what they are not meant to be. What are they meant to be and what are they meant to do? And my answer is they are administrators. What they're meant to do is to administer. And that brings us to the question, what is this strange activity? Now, this is a question I've been gently contemplating, as Peter suggested, for the past 30 years, ever since I made my way from the calm abstractions of philosophical donnery into number 10 Downing Street and found myself surrounded for the first time by the finest exemplars of the administrative civil service. At that time, I observed Robert Armstrong's Rolls-Royce minutes quietly gliding across from the Cabinet Office. I listened to Robin Butler and Charles Powell managing the affairs of a great Prime Minister. I witnessed the calm efficiency with which Michael Scholar and Andrew Turnbull and David Norgrove and others dispatched the business of government from the private office. These fine officials made me understand a great deal about what an administrative civil service ought to be. Then, as now, the virtues they displayed were not universal, but they provided a model of the thing at its best. At the same time, as I passed under review the broad sweep of political theory from Plato to Rawls, I found, my, to my surprise, that with the honourable exception of Weber, no major theorist has made any appreciable effort to recognise the significance of administration as part of government. Ministers, parliaments, courts, laws, class relationships, systems, interests, all of these figure, of course. But in the theory of politics, administration is all but absent. It's simply taken for granted that once arranged in a certain way, the state will conduct its affairs, as if, if only, it were so obvious. The truth is, as my examples from other countries are intended to illustrate, administration is anything but obvious. Uh, Volheim once said of artistic style that it's an achievement of an artist to have a style, any style. And in the same way, it's an achievement of a state to have an administration any administration. The historians have a much firmer grip on this than the political theorists. They chart the development of administration in Rome, in China, in Byzantium, under the Angevins, under Napoleon, and in the modern state. They recognize that it's an achievement to construct and maintain an administration. But historians are historians. They write history. They don't, on the whole, deal in abstractions. So they inevitably leave us with a question unanswered. What is it exactly that administrators in the modern liberal democracy are meant to do. My answer after this rather prolonged period of contemplation is that the administrative civil service in a modern liberal democracy characteristically needs to engage in four distinct but related activities. The accumulation of knowledge, the transmission of decisions, the provision of advice, and what I call guardianship. The trick that needs to be pulled off is to engage simultaneously and successfully in each of these four types of activity. Where the administrative civil service succeeds in pulling off that trick, which at its best it does today, it brings something of inestimable value to Britain. And by the same token, it's hugely in Britain's interest that we should have a civil service reform of the kind now being promoted by Francis and Bob to ensure that so far as possible, these four critical activities are carried out successfully and simultaneously in all parts of the civil service. I want now to go through each of those four activities. Accumulation 
of knowledge is the aspect of administration that most interested Weber. As he pointed out, and as is once pointed out quite obvious, the administrative civil service in the modern state needs to perform the role of ensuring that someone, somewhere, knows the answer to the question, how does the system work? We too often forget that the functioning of a modern liberal state depends not only on law and law courts, but also on the maintenance of settled process. When Maitland remarked that liberty resides in the interstices of the law, he was highlighting the significance of due process, which is the only safeguard of fairness and stable expectations, whether in court or in dealings with power. In the absence of due process, every trial becomes a trial out of Kafka, and every dealing with government becomes something out of darkness at noon. But however great the temptation to forget the fundamental importance of due process, commentators are even more inclined to forget that the maintenance of due process depends on having administrators to keep track of what the processes are. And this accumulation of knowledge of process is the first task of the administrative civil service in a modern liberal state. Now, of course, there are ever-present dangers. A fixation with process can become absurdly bureaucratic. Process can become a substitute for achieving effects. At worst, administrators can hide behind process as a reason for not even attempting to achieve the effect desired by ministers. I've no doubt that we currently suffer in the UK from too much process. Some of it, alas, introduced by previous governments. One of the purposes of the present coalition government, both in our red tape challenge and in our civil service reform, is to prune back process where it's become too inhibiting and too nearly an end in itself. I'm delighted to say there's no more enthusiastic a proponent of such pruning than the current cabinet secretary. But as we seek to restore proportionality where it's lacking and to reduce the burdens of process where they become excessive, we should remind ourselves that we do require an administrative civil service that understands, respects, and operates due process where it's needed and to the extent it's needed. The second aspect of administration in the modern British state, transmission of decisions, is less obvious but no less important. Read a textbook account and you'll find the following charming but illusory description of our constitution. Uh, a liberal democracy, goes the textbook account, like ours, elects a legislature and an executive. The legislature makes law, which the systems of civil and criminal justice enforce. The ministers who constitute the executive make decisions, which are either in the form of laws proposed to the legislature or in the form of actions sanctioned by law. The reason why this charming description of our constitution is wholly illusory is that it entirely ignores the vital question, how are the decisions of ministers transmitted? A minister sitting in an office, even supposing that a minister acting solo were able to provide himself or herself with an office, is in principle capable of making any number of decisions. But without someone to transmit those decisions, they would remain poetical aspirations rather than actions. The activity of transmission is very little remarked, but it's both difficult and complicated. It consists not only of recording, but of translating, enlarging, clarifying, encoding, promulgating, authorizing, and often enough, paying and accounting. Of course, just as the administrator's understanding of due process can become a disproportionate process fetish, so the administrator's ability to follow process in transmitting ministerial decisions can become labyrinthine. Simple objectives can be turned into items of such great complexity that the original aim is either ludicrously delayed or altogether lost in the morass of refinements. Ministers need constantly to be on their guard against those tendencies. And experiments such as the contestable policy formation, which we had with the National Planning Policy Framework, are well worth using as a corrective. Fresh eyes belonging to practitioners from outside the administrative civil service can sometimes see clearly, through bizarre and unnecessary tangles, that those engaged in the administering of processes have come to regard as normal and inevitable. There's also the danger of sheer inaction. Either through torpor or positive reluctance, administrative civil servants can, at their worst, defeat ministerial objectives just by ensuring that when the minister has decided to act, nothing actually happens. Such failures of transmission are enemies of democracy. And one of the things that our civil service reform program is designed to do is to eliminate such failures. But the fact that transmission can become over-elaborate and under-effective shouldn't blind us to the fact that our administrative civil service, at its best, is fully capable of translating ministerial decisions into action. We need improvement through reform, but we have real strength. 
on which to build. Such transmission of decisions is, however, a very different thing from achieving the effects and outcomes that ministers desire. And this is where we come to the third characteristic activity of the administrative civil service, the provision of advice. It's extraordinarily important to distinguish between what such advice should be and what it should not be. To begin with, it should not be, uh, because the civil service should not be called upon to do this, uh, a means of formulating political programs or of determining national objectives. A state in which the civil service did that would be something other than a democracy, since democracy consists in the ability of the electorate to make a choice between programs and objectives put forward by competing political parties and then to hold elected politicians to account for their performance. Despite the calls for an apolitical, lasting national strategy from some, including the present Select Committee on Administration, my view is that any attempt by any administrative civil service to formulate such a lasting national strategy independent of the political program of an elected government would be a subversion of democracy. But a program or an objective is a different thing from a fully specified policy or a fully specified decision. And it is, I think, precisely into this gap between program and policy or between objective and decision that the activity of civil service advice properly fits. The administrative civil servant is called upon to perform the extraordinarily difficult task of discerning the nature of the program or objective sufficiently clearly and of gauging the effects of both government action and citizen reaction sufficiently certainly to be able to advise the minister accurately on which specific policy or decision will be most likely to achieve the objective. Often enough, this will involve a creative act, identifying subordinate specific objectives that flow from higher level general objectives, or identifying issues which a minister, given their higher level objectives, would want to concern themselves with if they were aware of it. We're dealing here with something that demands an intellect which is both imaginative and subtle, because how you do something may have an effect not only on the result, but also on the political character of the action. And it's therefore extraordinarily difficult to know where objectives end and implementation begins. What may appear from a crude perspective to be merely instrumental and accidental may well, in fact, be essential. <coughs> Lest this should seem to be a series of gnomic utterances, let me give a concrete, though I uh, hasten to add, fictional example. Suppose that a minister has stated in his or her manifesto the objective of improving community and village halls. There are, of course, numerous ways in which this objective can be met. The government could dole out taxpayers' money and specify precisely the manner in which it's to be spent on community and neighborhood halls. Or the government could encourage locals to raise money, do the designs, and contribute labor themselves. Manifestly, each of these policies may, if defined in sufficient detail and carried through properly, fulfill the narrow objective. But the choice between them is not neutral or merely practical. As will be rapidly evident, one, or one of the two proposed means of implementation is much more in tune with the wider objectives of the present coalition government. And there could well be some other government with whose wider objectives the other means of achieving the same narrow or specific objective would be more in tune. So the administrative civil servant in giving advice on how to achieve ministerial objective A is of course bound constantly to bear in mind ministerial objectives B to Z. And this is not a straightforward matter. It requires an understanding of the relative priority attached to differing objectives by differing ministers, as well as an understanding of how to balance short-term effects against long-term effects. And if the advice is to be useful, it needs also to be based on a clear line of sight from decision to action. The civil servant needs to be able to envisage how the policy on which he or she is advising can be implemented. But there are even more exacting requirements that we place on our ministers and on our administrative civil servants. So far as ministers are concerned, there is, of course, as is well rehearsed, a dual requirement. They need to seek, and then they need to listen to advice from their officials. But they need also to be sufficiently self-confident to exercise their own judgment and reject the advice if they aren't persuaded by it. And the administrative civil service, when providing policy advice, is required to perform a corresponding double act. We need civil servants who will give well-informed, fearless advice speaking truth to power. But if the minister rejects the advice, 
then we need those very same civil servants to transmit and implement the ministerial decision with which they disagree as energetically and as effectively as they would have transmitted and implemented the decision that they themselves recommended. This is by no means an easy task for a human being to perform. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it's not always performed as perfectly as it should be. And it's an aim of our civil service reform program to ensure that this becomes, despite its inherent difficulty, absolutely and everywhere the norm. But once again, we have plenty of models on which to build because this is precisely the double act that the best of our administrative civil servants already perform as a matter of course. And this brings me to the fourth characteristic activity of the administrative civil service, guardianship. Of all the roles of the administrative civil service, this is the one that's most problematic. The one that our constitutional arrangements makes it especially essential for our British administrators to play. The other three roles, accumulation, transmission, and advice, work naturally together. It's only if our administrative civil servants have a great accumulated knowledge of the due process of government that they can be expected to transmit ministerial decisions effectively. And it's only if they have a full understanding of process and of the transmission of decisions that they'll be able to advise usefully on the development and implementation of democratically determined policy programs. But in all three of these roles, our administrative civil servants are called upon to be servants of whichever set of ministers our democracy has placed in government. Whereas, in their capacity as guardians, our administrative civil servants are called upon to play an altogether different role, as servants not of ministers, but of the Crown, accountable to Parliament. I say the Crown because in our sadly unwritten constitution, the Crown is the metaphor for the persisting state, which rises in the person of Her Majesty above the process of party politics and above whatever is at any given time the present ministerial incumbency. In their role as guardians, administrative civil servants act on behalf of the Crown to ensure that the government as a whole acts with propriety and in conformity with the law. Why, one might ask, is this necessary when there are courts to ensure conformity with the law? It is, of course, true that over the past half century or so, the judges have developed administrative law to a degree that was unimagined a century ago. Our governments today are governed by that judge-made UK law, as well as by European law, human rights law, and international law, to a degree that would equally have been unimagined in 1912. Nevertheless, it remains true that UK governments, like any government, but even more than governments which are subject to the clear rules of written constitution, have wide discretion about how to act. And it's one of the unspoken roles of the civil service to ensure that this wide area of discretion is not abused. <coughs> the importance of this civil service role can hardly be overstated. It's one of the great bulwarks against tyranny. The administrative civil service provides a continuing safeguard that ministers of any persuasion will not be able to use the machinery of the state for personal or party political advantage. What makes the role particularly difficult to perform is that it needs to be performed in a way that does not turn the civil servants into being the civil masters. There's a constant danger that the administrative civil servant might use his or her position as guardian of propriety to seek to prevent ministers from doing things that it is in fact permissible and proper, but not from the civil servant's point of view necessarily convenient, that they should do. And on the other side, there's the danger that fearing this reversal of roles, civil servants will not act as guardians sufficiently to prevent genuine impropriety. It's no easy matter for administrative civil servants to steer between the scylla of unjustified constraint and the charybdis of insufficient constraint. Once again, it's an aim of our civil service reform program to ensure that so far as possible, we do constantly steer between that scylla and that charybdis. And once again, we can build on the fact that the best of our civil servants achieve such skillful piloting every day. So much for my analysis of the roles of the administrative civil service and for my qualified but enthusiastic endorsement of the quality of our administrative civil servants in carrying out those roles. I want just to end with a plea. It's addressed to all those leading the service and to all those commentators who have an influence over the service. My plea is this. Let's not make the crude mistake of attempting to liken the administrative civil service the fewer than 20,000 people involved in accumulation, transmission, advice, and guardianship with any other entity in the land. Most, 
indeed almost all of the activity of the modern state is in some sense businesslike. Of the 400,000 or so people in the wider civil service and the millions employed in the wider public services, the overwhelming majority are engaged in performing tasks with clear objects, arranged in units, led and managed by leaders and managers in the way that any private or social enterprise has to be led and managed. As I've said, it's immensely useful for administrators to have some real experience of all this operational activity. But the work of the administrative civil service is not the same sort of thing as operational activity. It's intrinsically governmental. It exists to promote and enable what Michael Oakeshott called a civil association, not an enterprise association. It's a profession in its own right, no less demanding and no less valuable than other professions. Accordingly, while we can and must ensure that the business-like aspects of its activities, its accounting and control of money, its use of physical assets, its procurement techniques and the like, are performed in a business-like way, as indeed Francis Maud and Daniel Alexander have been ensuring through the Efficiency and Reform Group and the major projects authority. Nevertheless, we must never allow ourselves to be gulled by the crude falsehood that all would be for the best and the best of all possible worlds if only all administrative civil servants were to be trained in some other profession or were to spend more time reading books written by or on behalf of management consultants. <laughs> the special tasks required of the administrative civil service to enable ministers to operate a liberal democracy under the rule of law are very special indeed. The skill involved in understanding the processes of government in transmitting ministerial decisions effectively in advising ministers wisely and faithfully on the translation of political programs into action, and in acting appropriately as guardians against the abuse of state power is very great. The possession of these skills on the part of the best of our administrative civil servants is very precious. The need for them to be possessed by those administrative civil servants who don't currently possess them is equally great. Through our civil service reform program, building on the huge prowess of the best, we have a duty to ensure that each generation of administrative civil servants has the self-confidence to hand those special skills to its successors. Thank you very much indeed, Oliver. That was absolutely fascinating as I uh, expected it to be. So many questions. How, can I just start off with one? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll open it up, and, 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 and there's a relatively brief period for questions because you, you have to get back for, for, for business. The relations between ministers and civil servants, how does that fit into the picture um, when there's clearly a desire within the coalition for a greater ministerial say on some appointments and because you take the blame? How do you define the lines with guardianship? Because you've, you've presented many respects a, 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 a view which would be recognised through the ages. You mentioned um, um, in, in uh, Robert Armstrong and Robert Butler. They, they would be happy, delighted, perhaps surprised to hear what you said. It would also be echoed over, over many earlier generations. So how does this desire um, in uh, present to have a greater ministerial role in relation to the civil service fit into that? Well, I, I don't actually see that as in any way a problem. Um, and, and I think you see this at the apex. Um, uh, the, uh, the cabinet secretary and the head of the civil service are appointed by the prime minister. I mean, not as a, just a sort of matter of form, but I mean, the prime minister actually has, I think every prime minister takes views about this. Um, uh, but actually, there's somebody else who's appointed by the, the present prime minister and presumably will be appointed by successors if the post remains in being, which is the advisor on ministerial interest, which is about as close to guardianship as you can ever get. Uh, Alex Allen was appointed by David Cameron. Um, the remarkable thing, and this is, this is what I'm arguing we need to preserve at all costs, um, the remarkable thing is that having been appointed by the Prime Minister, I'm, I'm, anyone in this room who knows Alex will know that his cast of mind is such that nobody is going to prevent him taking a completely independent Alex Allen view of any question that he's asked. He is a guardian. He sees himself as a guardian. Um, so I think it's perfectly possible to combine a considerable uh, degree of ministerial influence over getting the person who can do the job with the person who is then doing the job doing it in the impartial and proper fashion that my speech is arguing for. And another uh, point I wanted to raise, was, which you touched on, was the difficulty between objectives and implementation. 
which I thought was absolutely fascinating because, again, in the managerial, managerial creed, there's a desire to draw, draw a distinction, a clear distinction that, that ministers on advice um, set um, uh, objectives and you can push out to the beyond the 20,000, in, in your view, implementation. But you're implying it's much more blurred than that. Yes, I think it is. I, I, I mean, I, I, there was a slight ripple of laughter that suggests there may be other people in the room who share my scepticism about books written by professors of management. Uh, I apologize if there are many in the room. But um, uh, there, there are these sort of crude mm -hmm. theses that suggest you can sort of divide up the actions involved here in some sort of simple way. You can't. Um, the, the fact is that anybody who's seriously involved in the formulation of policy and making things happen in any government I've ever come across anywhere in the world at any time understands, has to understand, that you cannot um, entirely separate um, uh, uh, what it is to implement something from what it is to conceive it in the first place. And between the two, there's a whole realm which is partially envisaging result and partially modulating policy in the light of what you think you need to do in order to achieve the results you think the policy is there to achieve. And as you do it, you inevitably discover more about what the policy might achieve and more about the ways it might achieve it and more about the other things, maybe unintended, that it might uh, by mistake achieve. And that leads you to go back and re-examine bits of the policy and say, this is, this is a hugely uh, iterative process. And, and it requires what I describe, I think, as, as imagination and subtlety. Um, and that, I think it, it, th that is one of the activities in which the, the, you see the profession of the administrative civil servant most clearly. It, it, it takes a long time, and you have to start with someone very bright to get to the point where uh, someone can usefully guide uh, a set of ministers into a set of policies that will actually achieve the objectives they were really trying to achieve without achieving a set of objectives they were not trying to achieve and they were trying not to achieve. But well, you, you, you talk about profession. What does that imply for, which has been a mantra of repeated governments, bringing in more outsiders, bringing in more people uh, as in the private sector, voluntary sector, other parts of the public sector? I mean, surely the essence of a profession is a degree of barriers to entry. Um, uh, or something for a lifetime? Uh, no, I don't think that. I think, I think a, 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 a profession which is uh, self-confident can certainly uh, absorb um, both contestability and um, change and, and uh, fresh talent. Uh, uh, nevertheless, when someone enters the administrative civil service, they're not being asked, or shouldn't be being asked, to bring with them simply some other set of skills. But on the basis of, of what may be very great skills of their own, to, to find a way of absorbing the professional skills of the administrative civil servant. And that's quite a task in itself. Because there's one big change over the years, in a sense, if you go back to when you were um, <coughs> involved in the 80s, was, was more of a sense of monopoly advi of advice coming to the civil service. Now you're deliberately trying to open up advice. Yes, I think... I mean, because it's the one case where we've been through it so far, it's a useful one. If you take the episode of the National Planning Policy Frame, which is, of course, a highly uh, controversial policy, um, uh, what we were trying to do, in essence, was to take a 1,000 pages of planning guidance and turn it into, uh, mainly gobbledygook, and turn it into English uh, in 52 pages. Well, actually, it started off at 50. <coughs> Now, that is such a huge shift that I think it would have been difficult for anybody who was sort of in the system to imagine that it could really be done. Uh, but once it had been done by a set of practitioners, actually there were all sorts of issues of detail about it, which needed to be inspected by those who understood very well the thousand pages, and indeed more besides. Uh, and that process of iteration between the uh, practitioners who created this radically different shape of things, uh, um, much, almost all, actually, uh, there were only minor uh, aspects of where we were actually changing the, um, uh, the nature of planning. What we were mainly doing was make it comprehensible what it was. Um, uh, uh, but, but what had to happen was that, that as soon as you had that, people who really understood 
the system would look at it, were able to look at it, and say, well, if you change that word that way, or have this phrase read that, you, it will have effects you don't intend it to have. So it wasn't that we took the thing out and the professional civil service, the administrative civil service was not involved. It was that we uh, used the contestability to create uh, a, a sort of paradigm shift and then in came the professionals to look at it and that hugely improved the product. Yeah, I, I might say we, we, we at Institute for Government have, have done a really good paper. My colleague Joe Rutter has done a, a paper analysing that with some very interesting conclusions um, on the whole very sympathetic to the process because it was such a very interesting new way of doing policy mm. as part of our policy. Now, I want to open it up to questions. Could you say who you are um, and ask a question right at the back there? Um, yeah. Terry, yep. Yeah. Uh, Ian Corby, I'm a uh, political researcher in the House of Commons. Uh, Oliver, I didn't mean to come here and be deliberately antagonistic, but up until your plea, I was testing everything you said against my own experience in business where at sort of middle and senior management level, I felt I was going through a lot of those same processes of gathering information, providing advice, having decisions you know, made either in line with that advice or overturning my advice, and then trying to implement them in the way I thought my boss would like, and making sure my boss wasn't breaking the law and getting me to break the law in the same process. So while I see you're trying to distinguish civil servants, would you accept that there are administrators in the private sector as well? Well, I certainly accept that in a large corporation, um, there are things that go on that are analogous. Um, of course there are. Uh, um, but uh, um, if, if you are as much of a believer in um, uh, the liberal free market as I am, you believe that um, uh, by following uh, the desire to maximize their profitability by satisfying their customers and by having to innovate in order to do so. Corporations uh, focused on that, of course under the constraints of law and proper corporate citizenship, but nevertheless focused on the bottom line, will lead to uh, social welfare, to the optimization of, of uh, welfare for all of us. Not that it's their aim, it's what the, uh, I see as the product of competition between them is. Now this is really fundamentally different from anything that goes on in a government. Because uh, the thing that really distinguishes government is that it is not competing. I mean, it is, it is, it, it, the country as a whole is competing with other countries for sure. But, but government is, uh, the whole point about having a government, which is not a state of affairs that obtains at all times and all places, but if you have a government, the point about it is precisely that it is the only government. Not, uh, there may be many levels of it, there may be many devolutions of it, but in a place, at a given level, governing a particular thing, there's just one of it. Um, and and uh, uh, secondly, we don't endow corporations with power. Um, uh, they do not have the authority to uh, tax people, to imprison people. To, uh, ultimately, they don't have the uh, authority to exert force, sometimes awesome force. So in both of these respects, a government is a very, very different kind of thing from a corporation. And the people who are administering a government need to be alive to that difference. Uh, it poses completely different challenges and uh, it requires completely different uh, attitudes than uh, are meant to be exhibited by corporations. And I think there has been, uh, uh, over the last uh, 50 or 100 years, a sort of um, excessive fascination with um, uh, the skills in corporations, which are very, very important skills, enormously important for our economy, as are the skills of an entrepreneur. Uh, and some sort of idea that because of this excessive fascination, if only you could completely transplant these into the domain of uh, government, all would be well. Uh, but uh, I think that's false. I, 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 I forbear to mention the, the name Michael Hasseltine in that context, but uh, he, might, he might appear on the radar there. Um, uh, I don't think that's Michael's view, actually. Um, You'd apply some of the techniques, wouldn't you? Uh, ah, but I was admitting to begin with that there are analogies. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, I think actually he has a much subtler appreciation than that. Mm. Mm. Right, two questions at the front. Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Mayhew, I uh, do various things, lo local government and 
other things, and God help me, I've also been a strategy consultant. Um, given your experience over the years, uh, I wonder what your reaction is when you hear people, maybe over glibly, talk about either the changing or sometimes the declining quality of the British civil service, to ask it in a more subtle way, comparing the civil service you first directly experienced 20 years ago, what's it better at than it used to be, and what's it worse at? Well, I, I think what I'm arguing is that um, at its best, it was very good at these things, and it, at its best, remains very good at these things. Um, uh, and, and the issue, uh, to my mind, is first of all trying to make sure that all the rest of it, uh, which is less good than the best, becomes more like the best. Um, and secondly, making sure that we preserve a sense of what it is that it's there to achieve and we don't um, uh, lose track of what it is that it, it's meant to be there for. Um, uh, so I, don't, uh, I'm, I haven't uh, engaged in some sort of statistical analysis of the, of the number of officials that are better or worse, uh, uh, but my overall sense is that's not the issue. The issue is that it, that it has extraordinary skills um, uh, and needs them, and we need to widen those so that uh, it covers, uh, becomes the norm everywhere at all times. But can, can I take Jeremy's point in a different, slightly different way? Of the four attributes you named, Clearly, some of them are, 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 are more strongly displayed by the, by, the, by, by the better civil servants than others, and some are under pressure and strain. No, I think I've seen examples um, both um, 30 years ago and today of um, a, a, a numerous officials who display all four attributes um, as models. I don't think that there's a tension between them. No, but not that, for example, you could argue guardianship's been under some pressure over two long periods of one-party government and, and therefore needs strengthening. I think it's still, well, I think all of these things, as I say, in the sense mm. uh, that's the point of Francis and Bob's mm. performance is to widen this so that mm. it's, it's always present. But actually, um, uh, I've seen extraordinarily strong guardianship being exercised. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, perhaps it's invidious to name names, but I'm, uh, Sue Gray in the Cabinet Office, for example, absolutely a, a tyro of guardianship. Um. That's a t inter interesting uh, expression. I always get a new expression for you, tyro of guardianship. We, we, we can mint that for the... Uh, Roger Dorr. So Roger Dorr, uh, ex-civil servant, now a better government initiative and other things. Um, I thought your four categories were very helpful, um, but on accumulation of knowledge, uh, you were talking solely about knowledge of processes, and that is very important. But what about knowledge of subject matter? I mean, it seems to me that senior civil servants in government department ought to be on top of the subject matter their department is responsible for uh, through contact with academics, through think tanks, and through their own experience. Uh, should that not also be under accumulation of knowledge? Uh, second point, I wonder where you would put uh, sort of monitoring of performance. Uh, you talk about transmitting decisions, providing advice, but it seems to be a very important role. Once those decisions are taken and implemented by other people, then it's key for the senior service servants to be in pretty close touch with what is going on to advise the ministers. So uh, accumulation of experience in the subject matter as well as processes and managing performance, I think I would add to your list. Well, on the second, uh, uh, there's nothing between us. I agree with you entirely that um, uh, knowing what is actually happening on the ground, after the fact, so to speak, after the decision has officially been implemented, what is actually happening, uh, and uh, taking steps to make sure that what was meant to have happened does happen if it isn't happening, are definitely part of the task, and indeed I spend, personally, I spend quite a lot of time with officials uh, of various kinds, including the implementation unit, uh, trying to find out what is going on on the ground, and uh, if it isn't what we expected, why not, uh, and so on. Um, but I specifically didn't put that in as a category, because I think 
that uh, it's covered by the others. Um, uh, uh, if you are transmitting properly, the activity of transmission includes transmission up to the point where what I described not only as government action but citizen reaction is got right. And if you're advising properly, you're advising about what needs to be done to get it right if it isn't got right, and so on. Um, so uh, uh, I mean, we completely agree about the need. I, I just don't think it's uh, you know, on Occam's razor principles necessary to have another category. Um, and this brings us to the question of the subject matter. And that, that's very interesting. And, and your thesis is extremely um, beguiling, but I think wrong. Um, uh, uh, so let's take the case of uh, a group of officials who are responsible for um, uh, a department that looks after a particular kind of technology or range of technologies. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this, this often enough happens. Um, uh, MOD, BIS, DEFRA, DEC, there are many cases around government today, there always are. Uh, some of these technologies are phenomenally uh, intricate and, uh, and uh, um, difficult to understand, others are very simple. Um, uh, you, you might think, um, someone might think, that it was necessary for officials, who, or indeed while we're at it, ministers, who are trying to um, uh, govern properly uh, in relation to the development of those technologies or their application or whatever, uh, to become experts in that technology. I would argue that it's exactly the point that they need not to be experts in that technology. There are plenty of experts in the technology. Um, the question that they have to uh, uh, deal with is um, how ministers' objectives for the development of that technology can be realized. And in order to do that, they need not to pretend to be experts in the technology, but in fact to make sure that, that the expertise of those who are experts in the technology, which will always vastly exceed what they or their ministers can acquire, uh, is, uh, is absorbed in a way that it can be rationalized, understood, and, and its relationship to the policy properly analyzed. Um, and, and my point is that that skill, um, uh, which is part of the skill of advice um, uh, and uh, part of the skill of transmission, is incredibly difficult to acquire. I mean, it's, it's difficult enough to um, deal with things that you are an expert in but to ask uh, somebody to create appropriate frameworks for dealing with things which they are not expert in is even more difficult, but crucial. Um, uh, and, and as I said right at the beginning, I think therefore civil servants have to, administrative civil servants have to work with scientists, with statisticians, with economists, who are experts in that sense. But we mustn't think that they therefore are, I've, I've heard some people from time to time talk about generalists in a very sort of, hoity-toity way. Uh, I think the skill of the generalist, uh, which I would prefer to regard as the skill of the administrator, is every bit as great a skill as the skill of any one of these <coughs> experts. But could, could I add <coughs> one caveat question, which is, but equally, they need to be left in place longer um, than they often are, because one of the, all right, there's a lot of focus on moving ministers around rapidly, perhaps it will change over the last fortnight, but one of the real complaints I, I've heard from a lot of your colleagues is perhaps civil servants have moved around too, too rapidly. So even if you take the generalist view, you, you should leave people in place, not so they've come captured, but at least they have time to master and provide continuity. Because uh, I've heard a lot from your, your, some of your colleagues um, in, in office. Oh, I, you know, I know more, more about the subject than my civil servants do because I've, I've gone through two or three rounds of civil service shuffles. Well, uh, clearly this is a very intricate a uh, balancing act. Um, uh, um, in order to uh, understand the detail right, someone needs to have, an administrator needs to have quite a good perspective on the things that surround it. Mm -hmm. So it's important that there should be officials who do move around a certain amount and see more than the thing they're currently looking at so they can see the thing they're looking at in the right perspective. Mm -hmm. On the other side, clearly, if every day you're doing something different, you can never do it properly. And mm -hmm. finding the right balance between those two in a large and complicated organization is a complicated task. And one of the aspects of the civil service reform program that matters a great deal is the effort to try to find a balancing point there as a framework for creating a balancing point there. Yeah, right. 
Colin. Um, so the, the mic's coming. Speak without, uh, the um, um, is this making any difference? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, I'm Colin Seymour Ewer, and I'm a, a emeritus professor at the University of Kent. Um, and um, uh, it seems to me that, that Joey at Balliol and Northcote and Trevelyan would be giving you three hearty cheers. Um, and, um, uh, and I, in my mouse-like way, would be adding my cheers to theirs. Um, but what um, I'm curious about is, uh, in the broadest terms, the impact on this ideal. Um, and it is, you know, it's platonic and it's fascinating. You end up guardian, guardianship of uh, the decline of a homogeneous culture. Uh, you can't assume they're all Christian. Uh, and that they have Christian values that would underlie notions of integrity and uh, what constitutes advice. Somebody else who would be at home with this is Sir Humphrey, I should have thought. Um, and my question, therefore, is how uh, should the modern Mandarin it be identified? How do they identify themselves? Uh, what do they decide to put in their UCAS for, to read, if they're not going to go and be lawyers? that and the other. So how do you see them actually being chosen and getting to this stage where they can be brilliant guardians and brilliant advisors? Well, um, I'm going to give you an answer which will, I suspect, seem very unsatisfactory, um, which is that um, th there isn't any one answer and it doesn't too much matter which of very many answers uh, are given in any given case as long as the thing which they're studying is something that uh, causes them to acquire um, uh, very great clarity of mind, uh, very great subtlety, very great uh, imaginative and creative abilities, and a very strong understanding of history, uh, constitution, and uh, the nature of our liberal democracy. Now, what is it that conveys all those things to any one individual? I have no idea. It depends on the individual, um, and indeed who's teaching the thing that's being taught. Um, but it seems to me that you can just as well acquire those things by um, studying uh, philosophy as you can by studying economics, and just as well acquire them by studying economics as by studying philosophy. I don't think it matters, actually. Um, it's the spirit in which you do it and the things you take from it that count. Um, what I think really does matter uh, is that um, uh, we're talking here about qualities of mind, and those are the, the in danger of becoming sort of old-fashioned. Um, uh, I, 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 from time to time, I'm uh, sort of alarmed by the idea that I sometimes hear about um, uh, uh, that um, so practical activity is somehow completely different from intellectual ability. Uh, uh, it's perfectly true that someone who's brilliant at um, cracking the atom or thinking about black holes may not be a good administrative civil servant. But it's also true that unless the intellect has been formed in a certain way, um, uh, unless it has certain characteristics, that person won't be able to be a civil servant of the kind that I'm talking about. Um, and so I would go, f as well as character, for intellectual prowess in my civil service and not worry too much about which discipline they happen to have been brought up in. No. One final question, Richard Mottram. Um, <coughs> as, as an exemplar of the... Shall I just shout? Oh, uh, I won't yeah. um, Richard Mottram, um, for, former administrative um, civil servant, um, although I think the title was abolished just about the time I joined. Now I'm the chairman of a company and of uh, the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory and so on. Now, your analysis was, was um, of course, absolutely fascinating, but as I listened to it, I, I, I thought, well, this is a defense and an exposition of a concept that has been under sustained attack for the last 50 years. Uh, for the whole of my official career, which lasted about 40 years, uh, this type of presentation of the value of Whitehall civil servants was under sustained attack. And indeed, if a civil servant had, I think, <coughs> Uh, said what you said this evening, they would have been held up uh, to ridicule, frankly.
So I wondered whether, in, uh, in the spirit of the whole presentation you've given, if you've got any views on why it is that it has proved so difficult to sustain this ideal uh, of the generalist civil servant, a phrase I tried to kill because people said generalist equaled amateur, for example. Um, and then uh, perhaps a cheeky question, would your analysis, do you think, be wholly shared by your colleagues in government? Um, well, I, I don't mean that in a vulgar way, you know. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> I'm not asking you to sort of... I, I would never accuse you of thinking anything <laughs> vulgar. Uh. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, to deal with your second question first, um, yes, broadly. Uh, I, I mean, you won't be surprised to know that um, although um, uh, we uh, do very different and complementary things, um, uh, in this domain, um, Francis and I rather overlap. And so uh, the, the talk that I've just given has been um, discussed with him uh, extensively and intensively. And yes, we do agree about these things. Um, we, we agree about the need for reform in order to bring everyone to this ideal, but we also agree about the ideal. Um, uh, and, uh, and while I haven't talked to every one of my colleagues around the cabinet table, I rather think that, that it would get a pretty resounding agreement. Um, uh, now, that brings us back to the question, why in some quarters has this idea, and I think you're right, I would say probably over more like a century than, than, than 50 years, been under some attack uh, from some quarters. And, and I, I think I do sort of understand why. Um, uh, the, there is, um, you know, the, the, s stretching back to the, well, probably actually the, 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 the trenches of the first war and their ghastly effects. Uh, uh, and certainly the, you know, the white heat of technology in the 60s. There's been a sort of idea that, that, that a problem about Britain is that other places are more professional and that Britain is too amateurish. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, one could find many other words, but I think you'll sense what I'm talking about. Um, and, and so there was a sort of idea, I think, that it was easy to slip into that if you could only get, uh, if you could just get everybody to be a real proper gold-plated professional in the sense of having a technical skill, all the problems of the world, probably all the problems of the universe, would uh, quickly evaporate. Um, uh, and uh, things would be done in a rational and orderly fashion. And uh, uh, we would uh, substitute this sort of muddling through and. Uh, British preoccupations uh, of an old-fashioned kind with uh, modernity and clarity. And, uh, um, and of course, it is possible to be much too amateurish. And of course, there is such a thing as knowing something, and there's someone who may know it, and it's important that if it's to be known, someone who knows it is on the scene to say it, um, and facts count, and uh, so on. And of course, it's right that over the years, uh, increasing numbers of economists and scientists and statisticians and lawyers have been brought into this. Of course, this is all right. But what I'm arguing is that actually, if you like, that culture has been overdone. People have, have lost sight of something that was immensely valuable, is immensely valuable, and actually still exists. This is the remarkable thing. It may have been under some kind of attack, but you and I could both cite large numbers of people at the uh, apex of the pyramid of today's administrative civil service who have these qualities in abundance. And so it has not, we are not arguing for a lost world to be recreated. I'm arguing for something that does exist to be valued as it needs to be valued and then to be widened and spread where it doesn't exist sufficiently. Um, and, uh, and I think that's just all part of kind of correcting for some of the errors which arose from trying to correct some of the errors that had previously arisen. Um, and, you know, we cannot found an entire nation uh, on the basis of people who have double firsts in classics, but people who have double firsts in classics, going back to the early point, may be very fine civil servants. Um, and it isn't the double first in classics that matters, it's the attitude of mind that, that, that the person has. And, um, uh, uh, it's important to celebrate that and, and, and see that attitude of mind as one that we want to cultivate. Well, Oliver, thank you. I mean, I knew we were in for a treat. <laughs>
Well, we've had a treat, a stimulating discussion which only you could have delivered. It may have been shared by your, your colleagues, and, but only you could put that particular political and uh, historical, above all, uh, context in it. Um, I hope um, this will stimulate debate um, in a rather unlettering like form, possibly of Twitter, as well as blog <laughs> and other things. Um, and also, we look forward to welcoming you back for further reflections on government. Um, a lot of questions we could have asked, um, which we haven't, so we look forward to you coming back on another occasion to explore those. So, on behalf thank of the audience, I'd like to thank, thank you, you for this evening. Thank, thank you. you.